G'day guys and gal. Whilst I was recently on holidays, I found myself going on long ass drives to visit various scattered family members to say hi. Now, I enjoy long drives almost as much as I enjoy bashing my skull in with a rock while listening to One Mind Syndicate, so needless to say, I needed a solution. Now, I had never really tried audiobooks before, because I avoided long drives like the plague, and I found gaming or self-molestation significantly more stimulating than a book. But I was an avid reader in my youth, and I had heard good things about the Infinite and the Divine book by Robert Rath, so I decided to fork out some hard-earned hentai money and buy the audiobook to help get me through 14 hours worth of driving. By God, I don't regret it. I'm actually glad the drive was disgustingly long so I could finish the book in nearly one hit. This book gave me goosebumps, made me cheer, made me smile, and most of all, made me laugh. When was the last time a book made you laugh out loud multiple times? It had never happened to me before, and I've read a lot of books. Today I'll go over why The Infinite and the Divine is the best book I've ever read, and why you should give it a shot. It'll be like a book review, but incredibly unstructured, unprofessional, and full of profanity. A semi-spoiler warning, whilst I'll avoid discussing key plot points and twists, I will be referencing scenes and subplots that I really enjoyed and that stood out to me. So this is the kind of video to watch if you're on the fence about getting the book and want to know more about it, or if you've read it and you want someone to gush about it with you. It's probably not the video for you if you want to go into it with no backstory or context about the setting or the characters, but that would be a pretty weird thing to do considering that you'd get a little lost if you aren't aware of the basics of the Warhammer lore. Let's get into it. Firstly, what is this book actually about? Basically, it's a 10,000 year feud between two arrogant, grumpy, immortal robots that causes the fall of multiple civilizations and countless deaths. Our two protagonists, or antagonists, are Trazin the Infinite, a witty Necron overlord who spends his time growing and guarding his gigantic museum of real-life exhibits, and Orokin the Diviner, an incredibly salty Necron chronomancer who has the ability to manipulate time. And yes, it's as OP as it sounds. Trezin thinks Orokin is a nosy, self-centered dick, and Orokin thinks Trezin is way too horny for useless artifacts. Orokin also thinks Trezin is stupid, but to be fair, Orokin thinks everyone is stupid, so it doesn't really matter. They really hit each other with mad zingers. Trezin is like, Eat a colossal cock, you minge junkie! And Orokin shoots back, I would if I could, bitch! Just solid banter like that. As a note, the reason why this feud can go for 10,000 years, despite the Necrons only just starting to awaken in the setting, is because Trezin, Orokin, and a handful of other Necrons awoke early randomly. That's the basic setup for what the novel is about. Obviously, there is a main questline that runs throughout the novel and drives the rivalry between the two Necrons and ends in one hell of a finale, but that's what I'm going to avoid talking about because that's where the main spoilers are. Now, that probably sounds fun, because it is. The plotline and events are really engaging, but what really made this book for me is the tone and theme. The book is hilarious, but it doesn't twist the setting of 40k to suddenly be comical. The Elder, Orcs, and Humans act like they usually do in all other novels and lore. The hilarious part is Trezin and Orokin, two very comical and non-grimdark characters interacting with the incredibly grimdark universe. A great example of this is when Trezin unleashes a juvenile gene stealer patriarch on Orokin as a prank, without knowing what it was, and the patriarch nearly kills Orokin before it's fought off. A few hundred years later, the patriarch has started a huge gene stealer cult to emerge on the planet, resulting in the planet being exterminatist and billions of people dying. This is horrifying, and the book describes the gene steel uprising quite vividly and in gruesome detail, but you can't help but laugh as Trezin and Orokin are escaping the planet and basically arguing, and Orokin is like, you have caused the destruction of this planet, as a joke, and Trezin is like, it was just a prank bro. The two Necrons are so carefree and do wildly overpowered petty shit. You get to see a lot of Necron technology in the book and it's, it's just fucked. It's so overpowered. Like Orokin and Trezin are able to beat an entire Orc fleet and ground force with only a handful of troops and two ships. Whilst in a different situation, Trezin is able to hold off an Eldar Exodite army with only a small squad of elite units. Now you might be thinking that the Necrons are too overpowered and the book wanked them off too hard and it made the other races trivial. And you may have a fair point considering Trezin collects enemy armies like they're fucking Pokemon. However, the book also explains the huge weaknesses and the flaws that the Necrons have as a species, which explains why they currently aren't as big as a threat to the setting as they could be, at least until the Silent King properly arrives in the lore. 
I don't want to get too much into it, but it turns out that the trait of being extremely petty and wasting huge amounts of resources to fuck over your rivals isn't a trait exclusive to Drazin and Orokin, but the entire Necron race. Something else that really stood out to me was the way that the author, Robert Rath, was able to make you go from rooting for Trezin to rooting for Orokin, to rooting for both, without compromising their character or making either of them unlikable. Both of them have their golden moments in outplaying the other. Orokin is the one that kicks off the feud by stealing one of Trezin's treasures and destroying one of his exhibits, which Trezin hilariously responds to by taking Orokin to court. Trezin literally spent years researching Necron lore and he builds up a case against Orokin in a Necron court. At this point, for me Trezin was the obvious favourite. He was more charming than Orokin, I already knew a fair bit of his lore, plus he initiated Necron court which is gag Yaz. But then Orokin stole my heart, as each time the court case was going poorly for Orokin, either by him getting caught out lying to the pretentious Necron judges, or him accidentally admitting he allowed an entire Necron tomb world to get wiped out in a supernova, he just turns back time and changes his argument in court until he gets his desired outcome. This cat and mouse goes on for a huge amount of the book, and reaches an epic boiling point between the two, that causes insane amounts of destruction and irreversible damage to the Necron Empire. Whilst Orokin's feud highlight for me was the court case, Trezin's was a lot less clever and subtle, but extremely funny. Basically, every time Orokin stole the sacred treasure that he and Trezin were fighting over, he would destroy a couple of Trezin's exhibits in his museum. This literally hurt Trezin's empty soul when this occurred. Dude loves his museum. So eventually, he got sick and tired of the sacred treasure and instead spent years figuring out how to break into Orokin's room, just so he could walk in, shoot Orokin in the face, and then walk out. Considering Necrons, especially ones like Trezin and Orokin, are basically unkillable, as their bodies heal themselves or teleport them into a regeneration chamber upon receiving too much damage. Hence, Trezin put all that time and effort to get to Orokin, and trust me, it was a lot of time and effort, purely to spit in his face. Now, both the main characters being immortal might make it seem like the book's stakes are low, as the pair seemingly cannot die. However, without spoiling, Robert Rath does a great job in creating high stakes for the characters, especially in the second half of the book when things start to heat up. Instead of nerfing Trezin and Orokin when transitioning from the lighthearted feud to the high stakes part of the story, Robert Rath goes balls to the walls and busts them instead, keeping the story interesting by pitting them against an incredibly overpowered opposition rather than scaling them down. The point I'm trying to make is that the book has everything other than romance and space marines. It literally has no space marines in it, and for that, I'm grateful. Not because I hate space marines, but it's just refreshing having the focus not being taken away by some roided up super soldiers with limp dicks. The other Xeno races, like the Eldar and the Orcs, do get some solid respect here as well, with them being given the occasional spotlight and being shown as a genuine threat against the Necrons. If they made this quality and type of book for other Xenos, I think it would really solve a lot of problems people have. Look at Necrons now, a huge army update, and the Indominatus box sold like a bitch on heat. The Infinite and the Divine has literally no plot progression for the Warhammer universe. Orokin and Trezin both didn't learn their lessons from all the fucked up stuff they did, and all their actions were inconsequential in the big picture. If they took some Eldar Corsairs and put them on a hectic adventure around the galaxy that didn't give a fuck about the main plot events or the Yanari, the book could be amazing, as it could focus on being fun and entertaining and less about pushing the Eldar two steps forward and then ten steps back. Yeah, I don't know what GW wanted to achieve with those Yanari books, but it more or less killed interest in the Eldar. Good work, GW. So what do I rate the Infinite and the Divine? I give it a solid, well-deserved 9 out of 10. The reason for the lack of 10 out of 10 is due to the writing. Whilst being good, doesn't flow super duper well sometimes, especially during battles where descriptive words get repeated a little bit and it kind of breaks the flow. Like if you compared Eisenhorn fight scenes with infinite and divine ones, there is a noticeably quality difference in the writing, but yeah, that's just a nitpick. I also didn't really like the epilogue, and I felt like it kind of shut on the book's main ending, which was absolutely fucking fantastic. In saying that, other people would probably find the epilogue to be super hype, so it's just really a preference thing. The Infinite and Divine made a long drive feel like a walk in the park. I personally recommend buying the book off Audible. You can do a 30 day free trial on premium and get two books for free. The narrator does a great job with the voices. Or if that's not your jam, it should be pretty easy just to order the paperback. I fucking love Warhammer, dude. And that does us for today, guys. Why the Infinite and the Divine is mint. If you enjoyed this type of content, let me know. 
I'm reading the Eisenhorn books at the moment, and whilst they are super different to The Infinite and The Divine, they're still super enjoyable. If you enjoyed the video and you want to support the channel, then Patreon is the place to be, where only $1 per month give you access to a boatload of Warhammer Hentai. Hit the subscribe button, then hit the real subscribe button for more infinite content. Join the Discord for more memes, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.